I'd just like to take you, as the film will show as well, I'd like to take you on a brief moment in time on a journey, a journey which is our collective journey, which is for humanity, whether you work nationally or internationally, but it's based on values. The journey is one of 70 years, 70 years of UN. You may recall it was established in the wake of the, of the Second World War, following the tragedy of the Holocaust and humane and human suffering all over Europe and beyond. Um, the in, uh, camps of internment uh, in Asia, etc., etc. Humans decided, we, politicians decided, this cannot happen again. This is for humanity. The charter was established and it spoke of we, the people. The UN was always meant to be about we, the people, long before we got this colossal machinery. Many of you, and I think I haven't yet seen the film The Mission, but if I look by the trailer, I think there's some critique and criticism of the system, the organization, the lack of, the lack of accountability, transparency, a whole list of sort of pretty classic Dutch complaints, if I may say so. However, there's another world. There's a world of 70 years of accomplishment. If we go back to Doug Hammerskold, who said the UN was not established to lead mankind into heaven, but to save it from hell, we have to go back to that basic, particularly in the 21st century. 70 years, however, when UNICEF was established, World Health Organization, World Food Program, many, many organizations that maybe you have seen in the field that you know that actually fed children, protected people from famine, protected people from conflict, and gave them hope. I believe, and I think also Ministry of Defense colleagues, we're in the business of values and hope. But what will it take to succeed to achieve that different and better world for all? If we think, and I fundamentally believe the UN is always about we, the people, a different world, a world of opportunity for everybody, everywhere, at the same time, how do we need to work? Now, in the 21st century, we know that the easy way out, particularly in Europe, but not only, is to say, the world is too complex, I can't understand it. Well, they're fighting in the Middle East. Oh, dear, oh, dear, it must be religion. Well, I think as our colleague before, who spoke before me, has shown, no, not quite. It's not about religion. Religion is manipulated, is exploited, is, is de demonstrating to people as if it's the only way, therefore, the extremist way. No such thing. The voice of the UN is the voice of the international community. It's about yourselves spending time here today. It's about the voters. It's about politicians. It's about the people who have no voice. We, the people of the UN Charter, is about that shared humanity, but particularly of those who have no access, no voice, no means. But what will it take to do a better job for all of them? If the classic choice is, let's stay at home, let's not travel, dear, let's not take the car to Luxembourg, I, I hear it's dangerous back there, fine. We, you, are lucky to live in a safe place. But as today's challenges have shown, the 21st century, Brussels, Beirut, Bamako, and the next terror or extremist attack will happen. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So if our security, and our shared humanity means we need to share and do things differently, we also need to invest in that very system, and I hate to say system here now, that actually reflects and speaks for all of us, that has shared value, is based on human rights for all, not just living in the Benelux or in an OECD or EU country, human rights for all, access to education, access to health, employment, opportunity, equal rights for women, LGBT, there's a whole agenda that we are comfortable with in the Netherlands, and yet we think others could just wait a little longer. That is the UN. However, what we fail to do as a system is perhaps to act quickly, be prompt, be efficient, particularly that nice Dutch efficiency. Be task-oriented, have the results. Is that a system error? To some extent, yes. We need to be much more accountable. We need to professionalize the way we do business. But we also need to know that those who own us, member states, Netherlands and the 192 others, they really believe and make that system work to the best of its ability because others need it, want it. There is no choice but to stand for that blue flag 
hopefully not need the helmet, but when you have to put on the helmet or Ministry of Defence colleagues volunteer to go and wear that helmet for the sake of others, it is because it is for them, but also for a collective sense of security and humanity. I'd like to take a step out because there was mention of the chemical weapons mission. And it was an example of where the system, the United Nations, which is really all of us, can actually do something that was unprecedented. Leading a mission at a time of war, destroying chemical weapons by taking them out of Syria at a time of war against the odds, without a plan actually, and I think that's kind of uncomfortable. There was no plan because it hadn't been done before. Uh, there was no plan to destroy it at sea because it never happened before. We didn't know what we started, but all we knew was there was a mission there was a goal, and somehow in between it has to happen because it made Syria, we hoped, a little bit safer and it provided that entry point to a political solution that was so desperately needed in Syria. So disarmament was about the political solution for Syria and the region. Why did we do it? Because we had political support, unequivocally, from the Security Council and also from countries like the Netherlands. My own country made me feel very proud that I got the staff, the resources. Ministry of Defense was always a phone call away to say, what do you need? This demonstrates political will, support, assets and money. The United Nations, we the people, can do the unexpected, the unprecedented and can lead by example where no country can go it alone and do it alone. Most of the countries in the world are too small. They need to participate and be part of that family of nations to, in order to have their voice heard, but also to influence change. At the same time, the bigger countries like to be part of the family of nations because it's not seen as setting an agenda. So my ask, of course, is if the example of disarmament and that the Ebola mission, UNMIR, known to some of you, and again, the Netherlands also played an important role, if we can do it in this way, how can we change and push politically and operationally to achieve the change we want to see? I believe that there is no other way but to think and work internationally. Two reasons. One of them, local problems have become global, as the scourge of terrorism has shown. But poverty, uh, migration out of poverty, conflict, which drives the biggest ever displacement and refugee crisis that we've seen in modern day from Syria and the region. No bilateral solution helps. European responses, bilateral, are insufficient. And they may actually be counter human rights treaties we always pride ourselves on. Thinking collectively, working collectively, is the only way to arrive at that point where you can go back and say, we serve the community of nations, we believe that human rights are equal and everywhere, regardless of where you are born, but precisely because you are born in a place which is not the Netherlands, which is not EU, which doesn't have sort of the happiness index at the highest ranking, we are here for you. And this is ultimately, also for the Netherlands, the best investment in sustainability, security, safety, and that better world that we need. But it needs innovation, it needs leadership, and the courage to walk the talk. And that would be my last point, failure. We always pride ourselves that we've done so well. I mean, I think the public sector in the Netherlands is sort of the same. We fear the criticism when something hasn't gone quite well. Oh, a letter from Parliament. The minister has to respond. I know that would be the Dutch national example. In the UN, it's the same. Questions by the Security Council, journalists, member states, donors that say, hang on a minute, I have to justify this to my taxpayers. But without failure, we don't learn and the Syria chemical weapons example, frankly speaking, 99% of the odds were stacked, stacked against any success. I would look back and say, I remember at the time when the Secretary General called me to say, Ms. Kag, we'd like to offer you this leadership position. I said yes, and when I arrived later on to sort of start to establish, first thing I did was call my husband and said, oh, I didn't think about this very well, I have no clue. And it wasn't about the fact that I knew nothing about chemical weapons, it was that I understood that nobody else knew what to do as well. However, I had said yes, and in classic fashion, I think what you, what you sort of, what you beloved, moet you ook doen. I don't know how that translates at the moment. So, um, what you beloved, moet you doen. And then you just 
put your heart into it, but with support. But an acceptance of failure when you try to do the unthinkable or the unknown is part of actually the courage that we need and the leadership models that we require. Going it bilaterally, to me, is just not even a question to answer. There is no alternative, but if we believe in international solutions to questions that no longer are just local or let's look away because it will just disappear, think internationally, and I believe the Ministry of Defense is one of those very strong partners. But believe it, if you believe in international solutions, you've got to invest, not just in the helmet, you've got to invest in conflict prevention, in conflict management, you've got to tackle problems at their root, and that is tough. And that requires political courage to basically deliver the message that the solutions are never easy and need to be negotiated. But change is coming, and I believe we are working for we the people, with the private sector, with civil society, with networks of courageous individuals we, whose names we'll never know, but they deserve to be covered with the flag because they honor their flag. And it's about we the people. And thank you very much.